Welcome back to the Relentless Minds podcast. I am your host, Lori Jimenez. I created this platform with a sole mission, and that is to inspire people of all backgrounds to create the change they wish to see in their lives and in the world by sharing the examples of those who are. As a listener, you will hear the stories of ordinary men and women with extraordinary stories of overcoming adversities in order to experience the life they dream of. All of these individuals share a common interest. They desire a change for the better, and they are in a relentless pursuit to create that for themselves. If you're looking for inspiration to overcome challenges in your own life, to create a life that you desire to have, then you have come to the right place. You see, the truth is, people everywhere are fighting for what they believe in, and together, with relentless action and mental strength, I have no doubt that we can fulfill that dream. Welcome back to Relentless Minds. Today, I speak with Justin Constantine, a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Marine Corps and a former attorney. In 2006, Justin volunteered to deploy to Iraq as a civil affairs team leader, where he led a team of eight Marines and Navy corpsmen. For his assignment, he was to help rebuild the basic infrastructure for the city, including clean running water, functioning electricity, drivable roads, and a much needed school. On October 18, 2006, however, while on a mission, he was shot by a sniper. The bullet went through his head and caused severe damage to his face and jaw. In this episode, we discuss the lessons that Justin learned from his near-death experience as it pertains to leadership, adversity, and maintaining a positive outlook on change. Recently diagnosed in January of 2020 with stage 4 prostate cancer, Justin still refuses to allow negative thoughts and habits overwhelm him and chooses to do everything in his power to stay healthy physically and mentally while undergoing cancer treatment, a feat that he has been able to manage well with the help of his loving and supportive wife, Dahlia. Now, without further ado, let's begin the conversation. Welcome, Justin, to the Relentless Minds podcast. I'm really happy to have you on here today for this interview. Hey, Lori. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, Justin, you are a professional and motivational speaker, author, and a retired lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I'm super looking forward to this conversation today because it's an incredibly important one, and I know that many people are going to benefit in hearing this interview. And we're going to be covering a wide variety of things from effective leadership, overcoming adversity, and the upside of change, along with your personal near-death experience from when you were deployed to Iraq in 2006. Since we are doing this interview during the pandemic of COVID-19, and that being what actually prevented us from doing this interview in person, what have you been doing personally, meanwhile, to stay grounded and remain with positive spirits? And also, because I know that being a good leader in the workplace is an area you focus on, what are some tips for how those in leadership positions, still having to carry out their normal duties during quarantine, can continue to practice effective leadership ethic with the current circumstances? Well, the quarantine certainly is a challenge for all of us, um, whether we're leaders or you know, top-level executives, mid-level managers, staff, entrepreneurs, whatever, whatever role we play. This is a challenge for all of us. Virtually every industry is affected uh, by the quarantine. And so we may have to do things differently. Uh, for many, many people, this is this is the first time they've worked from home, whether they want to or not. I've been working at home for, for a number of years now, so I'm used to it, but it's, it's different for a lot of people. And these aren't ideal work from home conditions. Some people may have sick relatives with them. Some may have kids, a lot may have kids running around the whole time. Some may, be, may, not, may not have an office at home, so they're working at the kitchen table. And one thing, it's probably difficult for a lot of people is drawing a hard distinction between work uh, and not work. And there's a lot of blending right now between um, working from home and just being at home. And so I thought about this in my own business before the coronavirus, of course, but it you really do have to draw distinctive lines. And so I was watching an a interview with General, General Stanley McChrystal the other day and and he was commenting on this and he brought out some good points and for the leaders it's really important to focus on communication because if you aren't communicating clearly to your people they don't know they may not know when when to turn it off and they may 
feel like they have to keep working past normal working hours. And so I think the clearer you can be with your people and with expectations, and the more you can get on a Zoom call with them and see them, quote unquote, face to face, the better. Uh, phone is also good too. Of course, we have email and text, but 70% of communication is nonverbal. So the more you can interact with people during this time, the better. I have uh, I have a, a practice now of daily. It's not a ritual; it's a practice. But where I spend the first couple hours uh, in the morning preparing for the day ahead, and that includes because I want to have every day be very productive, but also very healthy from a physical and mental standpoint. So the first two hours of my day are actually not work related. They involve. Uh, meditation, and I'm somewhat used to this. Uh, my meditations rate range from 15 minutes, sometimes up to 45 minutes. Uh, I think that's very important. I do believe in the power of energy and positive energy. So I uh, meditation every morning. Uh, I also exercise in the morning because I find if I don't do it, then it won't happen. And then I have a very healthy breakfast, and of course I take a shower, and that's all before work starts. And so uh, I try to go to bed earlier so I can get up earlier and, and it doesn't affect my work day. I also plan things out the night before. I try to have a weekly schedule. And then when I wrap up at the end of the day, I make sure I have a schedule for the next day. So when I sit down at my desk in the morning, I have my schedule laid out. I know what's important and what I'm going to be working on. And of course, I leave room in there for things that pop up during the day or maybe during the night over email or phone calls, but I think it's important to start the day with a routine that it just gets you in a good place and then have a schedule already laid out for you. And that's good for um, leaders and anyone else at any company or in a personal capacity as well. Thank you for sharing that advice, Justin. During these crucial times, people can certainly use these positive habits in their lives to provide mental and emotional stability. So Justin, I would like to talk about your personal story and go back to the period in your life that changed the trajectory of your life. In 2006, you volunteered to deploy to Iraq as a civil affairs team leader, where you led a team of eight Marines and Navy corpsmen. I wanted to know what sort of work were you and your team in charge of in Iraq and what happened on October 18th of 2006? Um, Yeah, so so for civil affairs, we we were trying to inject some money into the local economy. We were trying to put young men to work who were kind of sitting on the sidelines, being very frustrated with what was going on around them. And really just to help rebuild some basic things that any functioning city needs. And at the same time, the fall of 2006 was a very kinetic time. There was a lot of activity going on. We had troops in combat every day. We hit the improvised explosive devices or roadside bombs every day. Um, It was, this is right before the surge of 2007. So there was a lot going on. And we would go out on a lot of combat patrols where we would, we had several different goals during each of those. Sometimes it would be to visit maybe a family that had had someone injured or killed and they wanted uh, to be compensated for that. Maybe it was to meet with a, a company that we were working with to try to help them get some business going or with a local leader on that that particular day. We went to, and I worked very closely with a battalion commander. It turns out um, he and I, when I checked in with him, Lieutenant Colonel DeGrossier, he and I had played Marine Corps rugby together. So we already knew each other. So that was pretty cool. I worked, he put me on what he called his jump team, which was about a dozen of us who worked closely together. We went out across the wire, out in contested territory, about four or five times per week. Sometimes I would be with him and his team. Sometimes I would be with my team. We would go out. But anyway, on that day, in October 18, we went to visit a police station that had been shot up the night before by the Iraqi insurgents so we could help uh, teach them how to defend their position better. And then we went to a marketplace to talk to them about when they could get things going again to get some stores open. And I noticed at that time that one of uh, there was actually a reporter there with us doing a story about the colonel. And I noticed that he had been, he was just staying very still, not really moving very much. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's a terrible idea if a sniper may be targeting you. We knew there was a sniper in the area because he had killed a couple of our Marines in that exact area in the last couple of weeks. And in fact, we had kind of sniper teams out there looking for him. He was very skilled um, and, and good at what he did. And later, the reporter and I were in the same vehicle. We got out of the, uh, out of the Humvee at another stop. We walked away from it, and I said to him, hey, Jay, you need to move quicker here. Don't forget about that sniper. We don't want something to happen to you. Just, just to warn him, <laughs> make sure he kept moving. And he was just there taking pictures and, and taking notes. And he told me later that based on that, he immediately took a big step forward, and a split second later, a bullet came in right where his head had been, and it hit the wall between us. And so, he, you know, he escaped that. Uh, before I could react, the next round, the next bullet came in, hit me behind my left ear, went through my head, exploded out of my mouth, causing incredible damage along the way. People around me thought I'd been killed. The Marines thought I'd been killed. There was a lot of blood. Of course, I went down immediately. When the Navy corpsman came running over, they said, don't worry about the major, he, he's dead. They, they formed a defensive perimeter to try to see where the sniper was to fire back. They brought some vehicles. So they, they initially thought then that you were that you were dead, that you yeah. were that you were murdered. And yeah. so what was it then that made you know a couple people check to make sure that you were still well, alive? Yeah, the, the Navy corpsman, George Grant, came running over. He rolled me over. I wasn't breathing, but he he still that didn't stop him. He performed rescue breathing on me, even though a bullet had just gone through my mouth. So that must have been very challenging. He cut open my throat to perform emergency tracheotomy to so the blood wouldn't uh, cool my lungs and, and drown me. Uh, he was able to bring me back and keep me breathing. He put in some instruments called trumpets in, in my in my chest to keep it open. Wow. They were able to lift me up into the back of the Humvee, which wasn't easy because I probably weighed 220 pounds at that time. I was wearing 60 pounds of protective armor like we all were, so it was close to 300 pounds. They lifted me up, got me back in the vehicle, and then another Marine, young 21-year-old Marine, Corporal Bueller, drove, drove me to the aid station, which was a ways away, and you know, we, I, I noted early on that we hit uh, road, uh, there was roadside bombs every day, and some roads we knew we have no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't help it. We had a standing order to never drive faster than 15 miles an hour, because we knew if we drew fa drove faster than that, and hit one, we'd cause a vehicle to bend over and and probably kill everyone inside that. But Corporal Bueller put his own life on the line, just like the corpsman just did for me by exposing himself to enemy fire. Drove 70 miles an hour down that road. Um, eventually got me to the aid station where the doctors and nurses were able to uh, jump, literally spring into action and, and take immediate measures to keep me alive. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, uh, your, your story of survival, I, a big piece of this that I recognize was that in the, in the, first part, it had to do a lot with the people around you, right? Mm -hmm. They were prepared to act and that they had followed through with the training and that they knew what to do in that time. Um, and then the second part was the people surrounding you as well, supporting you and you asking for help, but also you being, you being there for the fight, present for the fight as yeah. well through your own recovery. And for the first portion, because I think it's very important to highlight that everybody knew how to how to act at that moment under that pressure. Can you tell us the lessons that you learned that you took away from that experience, what everybody did in order to help you survive? Yeah, well, I, I did have the chance to talk to the doctors who operate on me. And most wounded warriors never get that opportunity or, or honor, really, because mm -hmm. a couple years later, the doctors uh, who operated on me that day, that, well, their, their cat, Navy captain, um, invited me to come seek at a, an event in California. And I didn't realize, I knew it was for first medical battalion. I didn't realize it was, these are the same folks who had saved my life in Iraq a couple years before that. And, but they had been tracking on me. And so when I got there and they told me that, it was, 
you know, an incredible experience for me to say thank you to them. The Navy doctor had written a three-page document for me identifying what happened that day because he said, we served, we took care of thousands of Marines that, that year in Iraq, but I remember three particular cases and you were one of them. So he laid out the details of that, but um, more, more to your point, um, he said, look, we, up to that point, no one had survived a gunshot wound like yours. We had to come up on the fly with ways to fix this problem, to keep you alive. And we used protocols, what we learned that day, to help other Marines survive injuries later in the war as well. And so one key thing is, is I learned is well, there are a couple of lessons. One, like with George, uh, with Corman Grant and Corporal Bueller, taking some sort of action, even if you're not sure it's the right thing to do, or if it's ultimately going to be successful, taking some action is better than not doing anything at all. Just paralysis by analysis affects us all, but an 80% solution today is much better than a 100% solution next week. So take some sort of action in the face of a problem. But then also, you know, the doctors are able to take their their practice, their experience, their knowledge, and use it to do something differently than they had done before. And that's a very poignant personal and business lesson as well. Is like, we're not walking around with all the answers, particularly right now with COVID-19. This is a new thing for us. We're going through something new. Yeah. But we can take what we've learned in other instances. We can listen to the experts, apply it to our lives, and come up with new ways to do business. And for me, I'm a motivational seeker. I typically get hired by a corporation to come to a conference or event, do a live event, and, and speak to hundreds of people. Well, those all got canceled for this spring and summer. You know, th that's not happening. So I'm having to do things virtually, do things differently, but I'm, a, I'm doing exactly what I learned from that experience, from what those doctors went through, which was take what I already know and spin it to today's challenge and find a way to success. Absolutely. And, yeah, that's something pivotal I learned through that experience. Yeah, you and you speak a lot about the upside of of change, right? And so I think that's kind of what you're tapping into right now is, yeah. you know, you're having these these uh, changes in circumstances, and a lot of people don't see it as as a positive, right? And but you talk yeah. about change being opportunity as well. So how has having this perspective allowed you to thrive and progress in life? Well, it, it takes work. I think change is naturally a little difficult, a little uncomfortable, or else we wouldn't talk about it. It would just be something that happens. It's easy to get in our set in our ways and just used to doing what's comfortable. Whether even when we know it's not the best thing for us, and and just to stick with that. And, but you can't have innovation without change. You can't have progress without change. You know, you, we wouldn't be having the COVID-19 vaccine without change. And so that's going to help us for the, for the future. And so, you know, I I went through a lot of change. I was shot in the head thanks to some amazing people. Um, and, and then my girlfriend, who's now my wife, I survived. And, and I'm on a completely different trajectory than I was before. I did go back to work as a lawyer with the federal government and did that for quite a while, but I wanted to take what I learned in my experience and move in a different direction. So, you know, I could have stayed with what I was doing and, and been okay, but I realized I have a lot more to offer in this new capacity. And I wanted to, I don't want to uh, waste a minute here on earth and, and do something quite different. And so I put the time in to learn how to be a better seeker and to write you know, book. Now I've written two books. I'm working on a third. I read a lot of articles, join different groups, and spend a lot of time on this. But, you know, as I said, I'm on a different trajectory than I was before. We're all going to change all the time. So the question is, do you want to embrace it and be part of the solution? Or do you want to move forward kicking and screaming? It takes it, it takes some introspection and it takes some dedicated time, but if you're putting that effort, that brain effort into it, it will be to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important to to talk about because it is an active effort. You know, it's not something that comes naturally, I would say, to a lot of people. And so it's just proactively and intentionally 
reminding yourself, you know, that it is for that there will be a positive outcome if you just stick to going through and seeing the positive in in a change that's occurring. And I was going to ask you about your principles because when it comes to overcoming adversity, I think it's that's a very important aspect to it is just having things that you stay true to that help you to face adversity and to stay grounded and resilient. So what are some principles that you keep in mind that you stay true to that help you to overcome challenging situations? Yeah, it's good for people to spend time thinking about what their principles are, because if you never examine yourself, you, you won't know. You know, you might agree with what people other people say or have written written about or, you know, talked about on podcasts, but you have to decide for yourself what's important to you. And, and a lot of what the leadership principles I believe in, in fact, the book I wrote is based on leadership principles that I learned in the Marine Corps. And maybe I knew already knew some of them anyway. They're, they're not earth shattering. But I wrote the book as a guide for mid level managers because that's the level where I was. And so I felt that was what I knew about. I'm not writing, I didn't write the book for CEOs necessarily, but for mid level managers because many people are promoted into new, they do a good job and then they're promoted into a new position where now they're in charge of people but they don't receive leadership training, which can be a very frustrating experience for them. And so when I wrote about my principles, you know, I wrote about leading from the front uh, and leading by example, which are two, th those are important in the Marine Corps. I assume they're important in the other services of the military as well, but I would never ask my Marines to do something I wasn't willing to do myself. I watched Colonel de Grossier do the same thing his Marines would follow him everywhere in Europe because he was literally out in front on those missions. And so I did the same thing. Um, but that that's not just a military rule or philosophy. It's the same in private business or in your personal lives too. Like I wouldn't ask my wife to do something around the house necessarily that I'm not willing to do. Now certainly she's a way better cook than I am. So it doesn't make sense for me to cook, but I'll clean up everything. Uh, mm -hmm. to kind of put the load a little bit. But, you know, I also think I wrote about in the book about integrity. And that's something important to me. One time I watched General Peter Pace, who was a former Marine, four-star general, and um, he was a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President George W. Bush. And he was thinking, and he talked about integrity, and I don't know if this is his quote or he was quoting someone else, but and I'm going to paraphrase what he said, Integrity is everything. Or if you have integrity, that's everything. If you don't have integrity, that's everything. And it really does seek about who you are and and who you want to be. And, and if you're trustworthy or not, and, and if people want to invest time and money and resources into you. And again, that's important from a personal and professional standpoint as well. So integrity to me is very important. Are you going to do what you said you said you're going to do? And just the last one, and this is more on a personal than professional, but supporting other people uh, is crit critically important to me. I receive support from hundreds and hundreds of people, literally, during my recovery, and that ranges from really cute little boy scouts and girl scouts who came to visit in the hospital you know who just or or the dozens of third graders who wrote get well cards kids i never met or never will meet but maybe i knew their teacher or this is just their project but that meant a lot to me when i was in the hospital to people who offered me jobs once i got better a dozen or more nonprofits that supported me in many different areas of my recovery. Even now, uh, I went to PTSD counseling for a year and a half to a nonprofit, very helpful. Even now, I'm getting um, care for my mouth so I can have upper dentures so I don't have upper teeth. But I've had dozens of reconstructive surgeries, and now I found some incredible doctors in New York who are willing to help me out with that. So 13 years later, I'm still uh, being supported in one way or another. And so mm -hmm. I personally see the value of that. And, and I try to help a lot of people, whether it's 
whether it's just saying thank you uh, or giving compliments, which I, I think both of those are important, or donating to any number of nonprofit groups or support efforts, or if someone asks you for a recommendation or something like this, I'm, I'm, I will be there. Uh, you know, if there are some random on LinkedIn who asks for something, maybe not, but if it's a ship of some sort, I'm going to do what I can to help uh, because mm -hmm. I really believe what comes around goes around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, the help that you received, though, that's, it sounds to me, and from what I read in your book, that it was very, it was crucial for your recovery yeah. and your mental well being. A lot of people, although a lot of times, and, and you mentioned this yourself, that when going through hard times, especially like mentally uh, challenging times, a lot of people choose to kind of suffer in silence. So when it comes to that, if you could speak yeah. to it from maybe having experienced it yourself, or what sort of benefits did you see in, that you could speak to when it came to allowing people to help you and to be there for you as opposed to trying to deal with it on your own? It's an important topic that you raised, Laurie. And it's one thing when I talk to corporate audiences a lot, uh, a lot I talk about that it's okay to ask for help and to lean on others for support. And that's important personally and professionally. And, you know, I was very fortunate that my wife is, she's an educator and she was trained early on about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, more in the context of kids who have been growing up in tough environments who may have PTSD. But she recognized early on that I had um, PTSD and really encouraging to seek help. I don't know if I would have done that without her doing that because mm -hmm. certainly in the military, at least then, uh, it wasn't it wasn't highly encouraged to put it lightly, and it's still still a tough or touchy subject across our country as a whole. We have a hard time talking about mental health. We certainly don't talk about it the same way we do physical health, even though it's all one system, it's all interrelated. Mm -hmm. If I fell off a ladder and broke my arm, of course I'm going to go to the doctor. But if I went through something traumatic, I wouldn't necessarily go to counseling because of the stigma that's alive and well. And, that, and that's a problem. And so asking for help in that regard was very important to me. And since then, um, I, I realized that why shouldn't I ask for help? Not for every little single thing, but when something's important and I need help, I should ask for it. As long as I have a you know, secret promise to myself to also look for opportunities to give help for others, even when they're not asking for it. Because you don't have to look very hard to find people who, as you said, are suffering in silence because they don't want to put someone out. They don't want to ask for help for any number of reasons. But when you think about it, we all enjoy helping other people. We all, we've all done it plenty of times, and, and, or at least most of us have, and, and are happy to do so. And that's the type of reaction you're going to get if you turn to, it could be someone in your office, it could be a loved one like, like I had, or it could be a family member or a friend, wh whoever it is. And it doesn't mean recovering from a gunshot wound to the head. It could be a, a financial problem or you just want to talk to someone because you're feeling depressed about COVID-19 or mm -hmm. you don't want to play politics are going in America or, or you're going through a divorce or whatever that issue is. It doesn't have to be as serious as the ones I just mentioned, but open up because so much, so many of our problems in, in life, our physical problems, our mental problems are can tie directly back to stress. And part of relieving stress is talking with someone and relying on other people and being okay, asking for help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's so important as well to recognize that the difference that you can make in, you know, to others in the lives of others can start right with your, your sphere of influence, you know, right with the people yeah. around you um, to be there for someone listening to them um, or, or giving them advice, you know, if it, if it, if you, maybe you went through the same situation. Um, but that, that really shows. And I think that your ex your personal experience from what I read, what you, what you went through when your recovery, it really started to turn you towards helping others and trying to see where you can be involved in helping people or communities that are facing challenging situations. What was it that kind of moved you towards wanting to to fulfill that 
sort of lifestyle, you know, that purpose um, with all the work that you're doing, you know, you're teaching leadership, you're teaching how people can be there for, for their employees, for each other. Um, you started your own organization, the Veteran Success Resource Group in 2015. You know, you wrote a book and so you're really giving back to the community. And what is it that you feel like drives you uh, to do these things in your life? Yeah, well, I, I guess several things. I really like engaging with other people and I like seeing other people succeed. And and as I mentioned earlier, I went back to work after a year of recovery. I went back to work as a lawyer with the federal government. I was at Department of Justice and then on Capitol Hill and then with the FBI on a counterterrorism team. And I stayed in the reserves until 2013, I medically retired as a lieutenant colonel, and that's when I left the practice of law. I, I left the FBI at the same time and launched my own speaking business because I just felt like I had more, much more to give, and I wanted to I, – I felt like maybe I was a, ping, uh, a pinball reacting to other people's actions instead of driving my own actions and decisions, and so – I started the business thinking about leadership and what I had learned during my deployment and afterwards. So I talked about leadership, about overcoming adversity, dealing with change, and that you're all stronger than you think you are. And I did a couple TEDx talks on that topic. I started getting asked to seek a number of veteran events or corporations about these things. And I realized, wow, I really can make a difference. I can make a living by doing this. And I really enjoyed the personal connection uh, so much. Although I enjoyed every job I had as a lawyer, it was much, a lot more very impersonal uh, and much more transactional. And so at these events, I, I really felt like I was influencing people because I talked to so many of them after I spoke and they told me that. Also with a, with a veteran nonprofit that my partner Scott Davidson and I founded, now we have these events called Burbiz where we have thousands of veterans show up for events, and, and the whole point is free for everyone. The point is to introduce them to resources in their community that can help them while having a great time. And so they're sponsored by different, uh, it's called Burbiz because it's bourbon companies, and we have business going on, and that there's networking and camaraderie. We have a virtual event coming up with over 2,000 people. Veterans have signed up because we have if you remember the movie Jerry Maguire, we have the gentleman who is that guy in real life who's going to be talking. Everyone's talking for five minutes doing motivational videos. We have him, two Medal of Honor recipients. We have Gary V, who's you know an incredible speaker. Mm -hmm. We've got Prisoner of War from the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. uh, we've got dozens of folks who are really big in the veteran community to just send five minutes of inspirational messages to help folks who may be suffering during this time. I'm one of those seekers. I'm one of many, and I'm like 10th on the list of, of important people there. But it's it's part of giving back to our community, and, and I just enjoy, I enjoy it. I think everyone does when they get the opportunity to because, you know, we're here for a limited amount of time. We have an opportunity to influence others and help others, and I just believe – you know, I, I can't control what other people do. I can only control what I do. I can control what goes on in my head. And this is something my wife and I spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, how can we how can we build our own lives to be, well, first, what do we want our lives to look like? And two, how do we get there? And how can we help others along the way? And there's, we selfishly get a lot out of, out of helping others as well because it does make you feel really good. It's a good sort of selfish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to, I really like that you were talking about, you know, your wife and you were sitting down and seeing what you want your life to look. What are important values? Like what are important values for you that are non-negotiables that you, that you want to have in your life? You and your wife want to make time for them and you want to work towards them. Yeah. Well, so, you know, th things change and evolve over time as things that we focus on is really clean, healthy living and setting us, ourselves up so we can, uh, it's a really driven home during this time where we can be financially secure and personally secure. 
uh, at the same time, it's equally important for us to help others, whether it's people we don't know through different uh, civil rights causes or people we know very well who we know aren't doing quite as well and need some help along the way. So for, uh, for us, it's identifying what's important and, and as I said earlier, how, how to get there, but, but making sure we're taking care of other people along the way. And then the day it comes down to being honest with ourselves and being, yeah, and, and being very clear with each other and open lines of communication so that we are on the same page and we're pushing together in the same direction. I think a lot of times people don't spend enough time on that and there can be a, you can be pushing forward, but the, in, in slightly different angles, which grow over time. So I think it's important, whether in our case it's husband and wife, but whether it's with children or partners or whoever it is, that you're just very honest with each other and very open. And then once you have that partnership and relationship down, doing more for other people as well. Absolutely. And your partnership with Dahlia is incredible. The amount of support and the amount of, of love that's found that I could just kind of understand through the pages of your book. Um, it's incredible. It's inspirational. And I think that really plays a big part in, in everything really that you were able to, to go through to get here to this point and be in a much healthier place, you know, emotionally and mentally. Um, and I wanted to talk to you because I know that we, we spoke about this a little bit before the interview. Um, and it was about a recent diagnosis that you had in January. Um, I think it's important to speak about that if you're if you're willing, because you have a positive mindset. And I know that you said already that you were tackling this head on with, with Dahlia. Yeah. And so I think it's important to, to, to share that message and to maybe get a little bit of your perspective when it comes to your diagnosis. Um, and so um, stage four prostate cancer was what you were diagnosed with in January. Well, how did you take the news? How did you and uh, Dahlia take the news when, when you heard of it? Yeah, it's um, that was a diagnosis I, I received, and it it did kind of come out of somewhat out of left field for us. Dolly and I were actually in England. We had we had moved to New York four years ago, five years ago now. So Dahlia could do her PhD at Columbia University, and then we moved to Cambridge, England, last fall because she also, she wanted to do a, a master's degree in children's literature at Cambridge University, which was going to be a cool opportunity for us to both go. And I appreciated uh, life in a small, really a small village after living in Manhattan for four years. And we were, we were enjoying it. We were looking forward to lots of travel opportunities there. In fact, we went to Scotland for New Year's and then the next day went to see a doctor there to analyze some blood results I have. Uh, he was very concerned with the levels, and then he, he said, look, I'm, I'm not an oncologist. These numbers are very disturbing. I think you, it's very likely you have prostate cancer. If I were you, I would get back to America as soon as possible. Two days later, Dahlia uh, had already talked to the administration uh, at Cambridge and got a deferral for her studies. And we have packed up all our stuff, and we're on a plane back to New Jersey where her parents live. It took us several weeks before we could really get the appointments going with the oncologist. We were at NYU, and we got in there, saw several doctors right away, had a biopsy done, had a number of different tests done, and figured out what, what the problem was. Got the diagnosis at stage four because it had spread to some bones, and so therefore a typical early stage prostate cancer was pretty much out of the question, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, fix the problem. And so Dolly and I spent time together processing this, what it meant. There's no, there's no set answers. There's no, you have X amount of time to live, or we have a silver bullet, or, or you know, it's, it's kind of a gray area. We grab the bull by the horns. We really like our doctor. Um, we are also seeing a naturopathic a surgeon or doctor as well who focuses on prostate. So we completely revamped my diet and exercise schedule. So Incredible. yeah, it's, it's almost a vegetarian diet, but uh, I've lost a lot of weight, but in a very healthy way and, and have exercise is a big part of my daily routine as well. But uh, we're getting a juicer now because this is part of the holistic recovery that's worked for a lot of people. 
There was meditation and positive imagery and social networking as well. So I'm trying to spend time at least over the phone now with friends and family more than before. And, and so it, it's taken everything I learned before and really it, it, this is much more challenging this time around. But we're doing it together. And this is just our challenge. Everyone has challenges. One of the ways, you know, I mentioned earlier, having a plan. And Dahlia and I have a weekly meeting called State of the Casa where we work on our house. And that way we come together for about an hour and have we go over things that we're working on individually and together and just what's the state of of our lives, uh, financially, personally, and professionally, and making sure that we're pushing forward together. And so now this is my treatment plan, recovery plan is part of that. Part of the recovery is the physical side. You know, I take probably 20 or 30 pills a day um, for different things. The physical workouts are hard because a lot of the medication is draining. Um, they're the to chemo and then um sticking to a, a diet where i've you know no alcohol no sugar no white flour no meat things like that that's very different than what i'm used to but all that said that's easier than than the mental aspect because i'm i'm embracing the idea uh it's called the law of attraction and uh, things are energy based and we can make a difference with our minds there are many studies that show uh, those who have complete remission from cancer or other serious diseases, a lot of that started with their minds and not just thinking life is good, but really to the cellular level, imagining their bodies getting better and healthier because of what they imagine. And they've seen this type of result physically and in business and, and personally and re with relationships. So why wouldn't I try doing that too? It's challenging because as a lawyer and as an analytic person, it's not intuitive to me. Um, like yeah. that is a little bit more so with Dahlia, but. <laughs> it's more of like the logical side of the brain kind of right. switches on and is you're like, this is impossible. But. Yeah, but, but, it, but it's not. And so I'm, I'm training myself that way and I'm, I'm really embracing this, and I hope it works. Yeah, uh, I, I believe it will work. I love that you are approaching this with such a positive light and positive energy, and really not make not letting it overwhelm you and take over because a lot of people could possibly say well there's no point in doing this there's no point in doing that and i'm sure maybe those thoughts come go through your head but the fact that you are actively putting in that work every single day to stay consistent and i love the help that i know i'm sure in the support that dahlia is giving you for you guys to do it together you know which is powerful and so i think anybody kind of going through these situations as well finding that person finding that family member that friend that can walk the circumstances with you and support, you know, it's very, very important. And I truly, truly, you know, and I hope that we can, that you can keep me updated and we can know, you know, everything that's going on as things are progressing. Cause I have to tell you, it's just, it really inspires me just to have read your book, to know what you've been through and then to hear that then you had the diagnosis in January, then to see how you're responding to that is so powerful. And right. And it's such an example to so many people. And Justin, so I truly wanted to thank you so much for, for being here, for sharing everything, for speaking about your perspective, your philosophies in life, and how uh, others can learn from that as well and take it into their own lives to, to change their life. I hope so. I learned from lots of other people. I'm not inventing any of this material. And so if any of your listeners find value and it applies to their lives, then mission accomplished for me. Absolutely. Was there anything else that you wanted to share before we, we wrap up the interview? No, I, I just, uh, one, one point that we already said is it's important to ask for help, but the other side of that coin is to keep an eye out for opportunities where you can help other people as well. Absolutely. And so thank you so much, Justin, for taking the time yeah. to share your story. I know that your words will inspire many. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thanks, Lori. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it and feel inspired and would like to be a part of the Relentless Minds community, you can join the movement for change on Instagram and Twitter. We would also love to know how your experience has been as a listener. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, 
rate, and review this podcast. Join us next week for another powerful story. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.